I think on the whole I do have a bit of a style. I like to sort of combine sort of the modern and more traditional lines. Um, I have a have a collection I call the Inspire Collection, which is my expression of my love of the outdoors. The ideas of, of, of glaciers and, and rivers and moraki boulders. Welcome to a Kiwi Original. This is episode 18. And today on the show, I'm joined by Greg Holland from Greg Holland Jeweler. So we're actually going to be talking to the man who does the designing and crafting of unique one-off pieces of jewelry. And what you're gonna hear from Greg is his approach and how that's different because there's anyone can make jewelry mass produced, but what Greg does that's different is he's called the dream catcher. Starts with the dream, go to the design and then through to the crafting. So great to have you on the show today, Greg. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. So tell me, um, what originally got you into making jewellery, something that's so precise and tiny and kind of um, high value? Like it's it's something that goes, it's one of our oldest pres- uh, professions in the world. What what got you yeah. started? Um, the honest answer is, I get asked this quite a lot, um, the honest answer is I was a very disillusioned uh, student leaving school. Um my parents were both in business and I learnt by watching them that there was another there was something else out there for me and, and um stumbled across this jewellery apprenticeship and um haven't looked back. Um I remember day one being just completely fascinated by these sparkly gems. Um but yeah, it really is that simple. Um yeah, so I did an apprenticeship in Newmarket back in I started in nineteen eighty six. Wow. Um, yeah, so it's been a while. How long is the apprenticeship, and then at what year after that finished did you, you know, wake up one day and think, I'm actually good at this now? Uh, so the apprenticeship was four years or 8,000 hours, whatever came first, um, and it was the 8,000 hours. So it was just shy of four years. Um, and then this was sort of around the time of 87 that, you know, we went from a boom time where our Christmas rush and the factory I was working in started in September to being made redundant pretty much. Um, so it was an interesting time, but I I then travelled. I went to the UK for four years and I didn't actually work in the industry there. I found it very, very difficult to get into. Uh, very, very much a closed shop back in, back in the day. Is that the Hatton so, Garden area around there? Yeah, it was, yeah, really based around Hatton Garden in London there. Um, I actually was door knocking, and one particular day I had the door shut in my face, and I thought, okay, I need to do something else. <laughs> <laughs> so I um, I signed up with a construction agency and, and did a bit of construction work and travelled as much as possible. But yeah, look, I um, I then came back to New Zealand and moved to Wellington. I was in Wellington in the Hope Gibbons building for the best part of eight years. Um, operating there as a, as a contract diamond setter for other jewellers around the country. And that was a, quite a nice little niche. Um, we were finishing other people's jewellery for them. And again, decided that that was potentially the wrong path and decided to start my own business when I moved back to Auckland in 2002. What does it take to start a, a jewellery business? Because obviously at, in 2002, by then, you've been um, manufacturing or being... Uh, part of the manufacturing process of jewellery for some time. Mm. Uh, but you know, buying a, a piece of jewellery is quite an investment. What's it like to then start up an entire jewellery shop? Yeah. Yeah, look, I was very deliberate. Um, it's it's sort of more in vogue nowadays, but I back in the day, I sort of broke the rules a little bit where I, I found a space upstairs on the first floor. So I'm in the centre of Newmarket with very um, reasonable rent and very reasonable overhead, so that was the first thing. Um, you don't need much space. And what I was offering was more of a customer experience, and so it's, it's quite an intimate space. It's not very big, uh, but it's enough space to just meet someone or meet a couple or meet you know whoever that wants to come up and, and join me um, and discuss their their wants and dreams sort of in, in reasonably in private. So I have a couple of small cabinets with some pieces you know, on display, more sort of as, as examples of what I can do. I mean, I do sell stock items, but 
more often than not, it's like people are saying, yeah, I really like that. However, you know, that leads on to what can we do for you sort of thing. So it's very personal. Um, yeah. What are some of the customers that come and see you in new market? Um, what are they looking to either celebrate or remember or achieve? What's the the, the mm. goal that they have in mind? And then how do you take that goal and make it into something that's, uh, that reflects it? Yeah, it, generally, it's obviously a celebration of some sort. It's a, it's a very happy business in that way. Um, I meet some really, really extraordinary people and we build some really fantastic relationships. Um, so, yeah, it's a celebration. Um, at the moment... I'm working on a success birthday present. Um, I'm, I can't actually manufacture the piece at the moment, clearly, um, but we can do watercolour sketches, and I'm talking to the customer at the moment about how he might be able to present those sketches to his wife as a surprise on her birthday. Um, so, yeah, there's always a, a, a happy reason. There's obviously the engagement ring market. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, a little. Uh, there's a bit of a sideline too. That I do a little bit of trophy design. I've been working with the Sir Peter Blake Trust since its inception, and um, doing lapel pins and celebration pieces for them with their awards, which has been really, really an amazing. I've really enjoyed it. It's probably one of my favourite projects every year. Um, What's the thing that appeals the most by being involved with Sir Peter Blake? Oh, just you know, they're all about New Zealand. You know, the the legacy of Sir Peter Blake, of the leadership. Um, and then seeing my pieces being worn by you know, just a whole host of extraordinary New Zealanders, I, I get a real thrill out of that, actually. Yeah, so I actually, the so Peter Blake Trust rebranded last year, and so I'm now designing the actual trophy itself, whereas previously it was more just the Lip Alpins. Uh, yeah, it's been a great project. That's uh, amazing to be to be part of that, and, and you're right, if you... Yeah. Um, I got some some little silver kiwis. Nothing on the the level that you're doing, but some little uh, silver kiwis made to um, to give to actually some of the politicians that travel overseas. And um, yeah. completely forgot about it. And then a year later, I'm I'm watching. Uh, uh, who was it? I think it was Shane Jones. And there he, there's there's a little kiwi, <laughs> and I it, yeah. it just found yeah. its way. Um, and yeah. it's it's just like a little little yeah. subtle brand piece. But um, I can't imagine yeah. what that's then like to be the artist behind it, having thought about mm. the vision, having thought about the people and thought about the, the ideas and then mm. to actually see all of that come to fruition where it's, where it's on the person, it's, it's fitting yeah. the way you wanted it to fit. Yeah. You know, you referred to that dream catchers, um, you know, idea. That comes down to being able to listen, listen really well, you know, and listen to things that aren't being said sometimes with customers. You know, and and being able to read that, and and so I guess what I'm really good at is relationship, um, and we, you know, I'm able to build a relationship with my customers, um, and that's what I really enjoy. Everything sort of flows from that. And so once you've done the the watercolor, because that's a different skill set mm. entirely. Are, are you actually you're yeah. marking that up and and actually doing the first? painting yeah. rather than yeah. the, the material. Yes. Yeah. So often, often doing the drawings, um, taking lots of notes at the, at the original appointment and, and just getting some ideas down on paper and, and going from there. Uh, seeking really honest feedback as well. Um, and also you can tell when, you know, you're having those discussions, what's resonating and what's not, you know. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's a bit of a process. It, it's you know it's a watercolor sketch, and then once the customers, you know, I, I'm very um, fixed on the idea that I, I want to be clear that my customer is clear with what I'm proposing to do. So if I if I always ask for okay, where do you sit on a scale of one to ten with this concept right now? How do you feel about it? And you know, if you're an eight out of ten, then we should carry on. If you're a five, then we should we should review it. So my goal at, at the watercolor sketch stage is an eight out of ten. It's got to speak to the point, person carry on. in a way that it can be tweaked. But if it's not speaking to you, it's better to start with a different start again with a different concept. Absolutely. Correct. Yeah. 
uh, once they've given you that eight or nine or ten out of ten or you know said actually you're the expert greg I, I, i'm going to go with what you think is going to um yes. be there because you're the artist and sometimes it's better just to let the artist mm. be the artist rather than direct what then yeah. happens next so at that stage, it's then a case of, um, you know, we've probably had had a discussion about budget at the design stage as well, but it means, okay, what's, what do we want? Do we, are we looking at diamonds or are we looking at colour gems? There's another whole conversation around each of those, and, and I love to talk about how we can get really good value for money. There is a lot of, I think there's a lot of misinformation in the marketplace there's, um, around how you might buy a diamond. I think people... So you may feel like they're making an informed decision based on four basic parameters, but I, I tend to disagree with that. There's a lot more to it. So helping customers realise the real value for what they have budgeted for. And often that might be actually, no, let's not use a diamond, let's, let's use a really beautiful sapphire. Cause, because you will get a much more impressive piece if you went with sapphire, for example, just with the price variations. So, I mean, I've looked on your website and there are some absolutely stunning pieces that do include uh, both the colored gems and the diamonds. Mm. Talk yeah. us through if, uh, let's say I had a budget of, I don't know, twenty-five or $30,000 to spend mm. uh, and mm. I wanted good value for money on my diamonds, mm. uh, but actually I wanted some, some complexity in the design of it and I mm. wanted some colored gems included. Um, yeah. What... How would you then you know, use that as a guide to then bring that, that watercolour to life? So from the watercolour stage, I'd actually bring stones in um, in person and we'd actually lay them up. So there's two ways. We can lay them up on paper or we can I can actually carve a wax model and lay stones into a wax model so the person can actually try. If it's a ring, they can actually physically try that on. Wow. It's a wax model stage with those stones in set. Um, so we get a very, very good sense of what that might feel like and look like. And I think feel like's really interesting too because unlike a mass producer, I'm putting metal into my piece rather than taking it out. A mass producer will take metal out of a mount, a ring mount, and hollow it out wherever possible and make it as light as possible. And I'm the reverse. And so yeah. there... It might be... Sorry, go for it. Oh, I was just going to say, it might be fine, it might be elegant, it's just a solid. So they can feel uh, that, that solid, yeah, yeah. and are they they're holding up their hand, looking at it, looking at how it's actually fitting? Yeah, and with platinum, you know, it's a very dense, quite a heavy metal. So with a platinum ring, you definitely, a solid platinum ring, you definitely know you're wearing something. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't just look good, it feels good too. So that, that process takes a lot of the guesswork out of it, and I think should... Yeah lower the the barrier to um, uh, engaging on this process and, and I would imagine it would take some period of time um, what, once the once you've finished the project what then happens once you've handed it over do you do you ever get customers coming back to you um, saying you know the feedback they've got or, or does that actually start um, an ongoing relationship where then that's just actually the first uh, piece of jewelry of many for them or their family yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Definitely, they. What I found is, is people are very, very loyal. Um, you become often the family jeweler, and yeah, um, scarily, I've been in it long enough that I'm now working for customers' children. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's definitely true. Um, that must give you yeah, a, a yeah. immense sense of satisfaction. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It does absolutely. You know, if if they are willing to trust me to that level, then that that's an honour to me. That totally, you know, that's that's what it's all about. I think I've succeeded at that point. Yeah. Now, before we we started the the recording, we were briefly chatting about uh, engagement rings and uh, how lockdown might affect or uh, influence yeah. the potential yeah. for purchasing engagement rings. Um, yeah. What advice would you have for someone out there? thinking of proposing or thinking through lockdown that person that they're in the bubble with actually is the person they want to spend the rest of their life mm. with. Uh, what advice would you give them for the the journey they're about to embark on? Well, I think if you can survive lockdown with your 
your partner, then you're probably on the right track. Um, I do feel for for people who are wanting to look for an engagement ring but just don't quite know where to start or, or are intimidated by what, you know, what is this going to look like? What will it cost? Um, so to work with someone who at that level is really great because they can sort of dispel some myths you know, it doesn't have to be three months income, period. It's whatever you choose to spend. Um, yeah, and, and, and just show them that actually this is what we can achieve um, if you choose to. And, you know, it doesn't have to be $25,000. Sorry to interrupt. This won't take long. Subscribe to the show and you'll never miss another one of these amazing episodes. Right back to the show. At all. And, and I think uh, that that's interesting because the the initial, uh, you know, if you go back to De Beers uh, in Diamonds, it's mm. a great marketing story around. Oh, it's incredible. Um, Absolutely incredible. You know, diamonds are a girl's best friend and diamonds are forever yeah. and, you know, all of yeah. these things to to embed or imbue meaning into mm. into a, a, a gem that had they had plenty of supply of, but they just made it scarce. Mm. Um I don't necessarily think that that we have to subscribe subscribe to particular ways of being anymore. Um, and I think yeah. what's unique about what you're doing is you can bring to life someone's physical feeling in a um, a diamond set or, or color gem set piece of jewelry. Yeah. Um, is there a particular style that you have? Like if someone who has purchased from Greg Holland Jeweler saw a piece of your jewelry without your name next to it saw them at a mm. at a function is there a yeah. is there a feeling that it that it has or is each piece uh completely different yeah look i, I think on the whole i do have a bit of a style i like to sort of combine sort of modern the modern and more traditional mm -hmm. lines um and definitely i'm a big fan of color so i do like confusing color so i'm definitely known for that um, I have a have a collection I call the Inspire Collection, which is unique. Um, it's my expression of my love of the outdoors, and and these are re replicating the New Zealand landscape. So the ideas of, of, of glaciers and and rivers and you know and Moraki boulders, for example, these are all on the website. Um, but this is what a few years ago I, I I challenged myself to say, okay. I'm working for my customers and often driven by my customers' dreams and ideals, and that's fantastic. I still love doing that. But as a designer, if I took out a blank piece of paper, what's my love? What do I want to be known for? And it took a while to sort of, I think these things were, you know, sitting in my head for quite a while before I finally, finally fell upon this idea. And I was I was out ski touring in the South, South Island, and... Yeah, one particular day, we did the view from where we got to was just mind-blowing. And I suddenly thought, hang on a minute, this is what I'm going to do. It's wearable works of art that pay homage to New Zealand. And that's been really, I've had, had a lot of success with that, and it's been really exciting. I like that as a one-liner, uh, wearable artworks. Uh, yeah. That, you know, that reflect... Yeah. New Zealand. I think we've got something special here, and to be able to draw on that mm. then gives you all of these different um, threads of, of inspiration, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, and and then of course, you know, wearing my marketing hat, I thought, okay, well, okay, we've got the Lord of the Rings out there, and we've got the work that the Tourism Board are doing, and in New Zealand are pretty good promoting New Zealand and buy New Zealand made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it all seemed to sort of come together quite nicely in terms of the gems what are the the, the different colored gemstones and, and sourcing and um, what are some of the considerations that are that are non-diamond when it comes to jewelry that mm. uh, people may not be uh, either aware of or maybe relatively new to the industry so i mean when you're thinking about colored gems i mean it's it's a that's a really fascinating world i mean globally where gems come from you know tanzanite tanzania Zircon, aquamarine, it's a really fascinating world. Um, 
and but in terms of the wearability of them, it's it's for me I think about the colour and then the hardness, you know. So we've got diamond on the Mohs scale as a ten, and the sapphire at a nine. So if you've got to have the durability. So you wouldn't really want a soft gem and an engagement ring, for example. It just it just won't last. But within sapphire, I mean the biggest probably one of the biggest myths that the, that the sapphire is only blue. Or shades of blue. It's, it's not. It's every colour of the rainbow. Oh, is that right? Did, clear. I was, I was yeah, visualising blue. No. Purple, green, orange, clear. Um, and then there's the natural untreated, but you've also got treated. So I, I steer clear of, like, for example, brilliant treatment is so heating is an accepted practice globally. Heating with beryllium will, will so for example, a clear sapphire can be reheated with beryllium and it becomes this very, very vibrant colour at different temperatures. Um, I, I just don't use those. I, I, I have an issue with those and, and don't use them. So, yeah. Is that because of the? it's not necessarily considered as pure? Or is it, is it a, it's a fix rather than a technique? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not necessarily... Um, Certainly not pure, and and the treatment's not necessarily permanent either. Um, so I just yeah, I just take care of it. Um, and you know, in terms of sourcing them, I have local suppliers that I use. Um, there's suppliers that I have in Melbourne. And one particular example is of a, a family that's been in the business over a hundred years, and they're dealing with other family members in Sri Lanka, and it's quite a nice way of dealing. Um, locally, there's you know. People have been in here a long time as well, and you know, support them whenever possible as well. It just depends on what you're looking for, what you need, what's available. Um, yeah, and and a cutter, for example, what he wants to yield from a piece of rough. You know, you might often see large emerald cut sapphires, for example. Um, you'll often see round and ovals and cushions because they're yielding more from that piece of rough. Uh, outside of the the ring jewellery, do you do necklaces or any or other types yeah, as well? Yeah, everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What's it's, the most unusual you've, you've had to do? Unusual? Um, okay, I had an example in Wellington where I made a divorce ring. What? People getting happily divorced. <laughs> Oh, that makes for some odd conversations following up from yeah. that. It's like, are you married? Oh, no, this is my divorce ring. Yeah. Well, they came in together. They were quite happy to, you know, it was, we've had a, had, a, had a good life together, but we've agreed that this is, you know, we're going to have a part and we'll just celebrate it. So, okay. <laughs> I guess, um, yeah, it takes all sorts. We're all different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there any particular jewellery that you're working on at the moment for for yourself or for your family? Like, do you have side projects where you actually invest in jewellery that you want to enjoy? Interesting question. Um, I, not, at, not, at, not at this stage, to my wife's horror. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm busy sort of always thinking about my next concept and, and my customers and what they might want to be fair. I might get in trouble for that answer. It, well, it's just, it's a very common trait. Like um, I, when someone would ask me about, you know, so what are, what are you doing in terms of your, you know, your tech stack or, cause, you know, I like being the technology yeah. side of marketing. And it's like, actually, I, I'm running a MacBook Pro that's that's five years old now. I've got a new one. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's one that's two years old, but I'm just not using it. And, and yeah. I'm thinking, I, I'm not like uh, necessarily living the, um, the same things that I, that I recommend because mm. I think when you're in it, you, you know, you can, uh, you know, it so well, you can get away with things. Um, yeah. yeah, it's like the plumber has a, has a, a leaky, um, leaky tap as we come out of, of COVID-19 or, or over the, the next few weeks while people are at home, um, how are they able to contact you and, and start this, this journey? If this is something that, they've been considering or after listening to this mm. podcast episode, they've thought actually it's not as hard as I expected. And uh, how, do we, how do they get in touch with you? Oh, I mean, I'd like to make it as easy as possible. Um, so yeah, if, if they want to get in touch, then obviously just through the website or 
I've got a Facebook page, Instagram page, um, email. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm working on pieces at the moment with, with concepts so that when we do come out of this, we can actually get into manufacturing relatively quickly. Um, yeah, it, it shouldn't be an issue. There's always a solution. We can work around it. We can do a Zoom conversation if need be. So, yeah, quite happy to do that. And I think for those that are, are listening, we've covered the that process um, from start to finish quite clearly. Uh, and so for for many, including myself, actually, it's not something I'd consider it as that you can, you know, see it as a watercolor before. So it's not mm. the big shock in saying, actually, could you do it slightly differently where it's already done? Um, that you do get this iterative um, process where you get to kind of. Um, either approve it along the way or yeah. um, have a, a little bit of influence because it is a, a big investment both in the financial side but also it's going to be on you. You're probably going to be wearing it, yeah. um, if not daily, on a, at least on a regular basis. Yeah. 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 And look, I'd, I'd definitely like to make the point that, you know, a mass-produced item will actually cost you more in the long run because it's inferior. So... The perception is that a custom-made piece is going to be a whole lot more expensive. The answer is it's a little bit more expensive, yes, up front, but long-term, it's cheaper. Why is that? What is, what's you the... do it properly and you do it once and it lasts forever. It doesn't fall apart. The stones aren't going to fall out of it. You don't need to rhodium plate it every six months because I don't rhodium plate my jewellery. Um... What does the rhodium plating do and, and why is that bad? Uh, so a mass producers, they will use an inferior white gold alloy, which is quite yellow looking, and then they'll coat it with a temporary coating of very, very shiny rhodium, uh, which wears off. I've had that. I got a ring for my 21st birthday yeah. and yeah. I wore it for maybe a year to 18 months. And yeah. then just on the underside, it wasn't on the, the top, yeah. but it started yeah. to wear through there. That's, yeah, that's right. That's what that was. It's very common in the marketplace. But I, like I have my own recipe for white gold. It's really white. I don't need to write in plastic. And we often, with the price of gold anyway, we're often using platinum now because it's actually more cost effective and actually a, a superior metal to work with anyway. And that certainly doesn't need writing in plastic. Well, um, I've certainly learned a lot over the, the last half an hour that we've been chatting, Greg. And uh, I think for those that are in their, their bubbles right now through COVID-19, if they're, they're listening to this, uh, if you're enjoying the people you're, you're hunkering down with, this might be the time to <laughs> extend an a, uh, engagement ring or at least get into the, the planning with Greg Holland Jeweler. Perfect. Like the sound of that. Well, thanks very much for your time, Greg. And uh, yeah, I wish you all the luck with the new collection that you launch post COVID-19 and mm. uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you, Ron. It's been enjoyable. Thank you very much. Welcome. This has been a Kiwi original brought to you by the New Zealand Made team. Thanks for watching. Uh, the New Zealand Made trademark is used by over 1,200 businesses in New Zealand. Uh, the New Zealand Made team licenses that trademark. Check if you're eligible at buynz.org.nz. If you feel that someone should see this, share it with them now. Otherwise, subscribe to youtube.com forward slash buynzmade. We'll see you on the next episode.